They were known for their distinctive ringtone, which haunts me to this day. <laughs> Welcome to the Panic Podcast, a podcast about Portland's panic, but maybe not exactly. I'm Krista Mergen. Join me as I follow the quirky subplots and surprising characters that round out Portland's most lovable indie software and game publishing company. Today, how Finnish cell phone giant Nokia created the first feature phone to offer mobile gaming on par with handheld systems like the Game Boy, and how that device failed so spectacularly that it became a super popular meme at a time before social media really existed. And what that has to do with Panic, exactly? We have to start with Nokia in the early 2000s. Here's Panic co-founder and CEO, Cable Sasser. So, long before there were smartphones, we had portable game consoles and we had feature phones. Nokia, of course, was sort of the king of the cool feature phone slash flip phone slash candy bar phone. You know, they were known for being indestructible workhorses. So honestly, they made great phones. Of course, the iPhone came along later. We all know how that worked out. It was definitely before the iPhone because this would have been laughed right out of town if, if had this been after the iPhone. But yes, I think it was 2004, 2005-ish. The Nokia N-Gage was released in October 2003. So yeah, Chris was pretty close. My name is Chris Kohler, uh, and I'm the features editor at Kotaku right now. As Nokia made more and more phones, they reached this super funky zone, I want to say like in the late 90s, early 2000s, where like they were just making whatever. And there were like phones that looked like boomerang shapes and the numbers were like curved and stacked and they had phones that were like dodecahedron. They didn't actually have that, but they had a lot of extremely wild ideas and it was clear that like, We've sold so many phones, we don't know how to sell more phones. We'll just make all the weird phones. Whatever the phone is, look, Fred, you got an idea for a phone? It's a Tangelo with keys wrapped around it? Ship it. Like, just send it right off to the factory. It seemed like they reached this amazing zone of, like, no filtering. So they were designing phones in what felt like every conceivable button layout possible. Like, they had circular dials, and there were phones that looked like teardrops, and there was one that had a dial pad that was literally a maze. I, I swear I'm not making this up. I'm Alex Pasco. I design things for the internet. So one day, I think Nokia sees... People like playing video games. The Nintendo Game Boy Advance or whatever existed at that time is really popular. People have phones. It makes sense that we should combine a phone and a game machine, which actually does make sense. So they introduced the Nokia N-Gage and this was their solution. We can finally bring gaming and telephony together. And it was a big deal, man. They had a big booth at E3 to show these games off. E3 is the Electronic Entertainment Expo, a trade show for the video game industry. They were really trying to do this phone for gamers. So it was sort of the layout of a Game Boy Advance. So you had your buttons one through nine on the on the side and sort of a couple of them were sort of raised up and so those would be your a and b buttons i just want to jump in here and tell you that while yes they sort of repurposed the telephone keypad to feature an a and b button this thing actually had way more buttons than a game boy advance like twice the number of buttons and some of them were real goofy okay back to chris and so you'd buy cartridge games because of course you know nobody was downloading anything so you gotta go buy a game cartridge at electronics boutique for like 50 bucks or whatever they were and uh, put it in your phone in the first model you had to remove the battery to change the game cartridge so you remove the, the battery cover you take out the battery which powers down your phone you take out kind of looks like a sim card you put another one in, you put the battery back in, you put the case back in, and then you power up your phone, and then you can play the new game. And no human being on the planet wants to do that to switch games. And there was another problem with the phone, and this is 100% true. Just look at the photo in the show notes. It was basically the size and shape of a hard shell taco. It, it did look like a taco. You'd hold the long, long side up to your ear and the other side to your mouth, and you would talk on it and people could see the screen and the buttons <laughs> it was just real strange made you look like you had a, a giant plastic ear in sweden we call it the elephant ear 
My name is Ola Kolson. I work as an uh, exhibition producer at the uh, Contemporary Art Space in Sweden. Imagine the taco, not so that the side of the tortilla shell was against your ear and mouth, as you would think, but the spine of the taco shell was uh, pressed against your face. The, the Engage was basically a semicircle phone with probably some of the worst design characteristics I've ever seen. My name is Chris Morris, and I am a freelance reporter. When you talk on the phone, you don't hold it against your face. You point it out to the world. So everyone is looking at your phone and your phone screen, and you have this <laughs> massive thing sort of sticking out of the side of your face. And that's because for whatever reason, the electronics for the microphone and the speaker or whatever, they put it on the side. And I remember specifically reading an early article about the Nokia N-Gage, and they talked about this hesitantly, and they said, to spin it, Nokia calls this side talking. And I remember just thinking, <laughs> what? You can't, you can't just make up a thing like, you can't. You, like, that's incredible it, on many levels. It's amazing that they, that there was a PR person that came up with the term side talking is like an act of PR genius. Like, they sat down in a meeting and they're like, wait, you do what? Like, that's how you talk on the phone? What, how are we going to do this? Well, let's spin it as like a thing. Like, only the N-Gage has side talking. And I just remember reading the article and like being both incredibly impressed and incredibly horrified that they were going to, A, do this, and B, try to sell it to us as like a feature. Like, in the future, all phones will have side talking. No! No phones will have side talking. No one wants to hold their phone like that. We've had telephones for a very long time. You know, <laughs> you, Alexander Graham Bell did not hold the headset forward when talking. Like, anyways, that was my first impression of the Nokia N-Gage. A, you have to take out the battery to switch games. And B, it is the only phone in the world with side talking. Side talking was such a weird, unnatural way to hold this big taco shaped device that there clearly must have been some mechanical reason for it to exist. As you might already know, Panic is working on a handheld gaming device called Playdate. And even now, as the project is nearing completion, there are so many complications that come up. Hardware is complicated. When researching the N gauge, I figured, well, they clearly were building this off of existing phone technology. And the only way they could engineer it to be a gaming device that also worked as a phone was to turn the whole thing on its side when you use it as a phone to talk. You know, they're great at making phones, but it's a totally new device with more complicated components, and it just ended up that the only way they could get a microphone and earpiece in there were to put them on the side of the taco phone, or something like that. And then, I talked to someone who helped launch the original N-Gage. Yossi Solia now runs his own company, The Sexy Beast, a firm that works with clients ranging from tiny startups to multinational corporations on new campaigns and products in immersive, rapid-fire creative sprints. But back in 2003, Yossi ran the global marketing team for the N-Gage. And it turns out that this revolutionary device was meant to be just the first of what would hopefully be many phones to feature side-talking. There were, in fact, several prototypes going around. The N-Gage wasn't the only device that had the side talking. There was this kind of a touchscreen device that looked like it was thicker and it like almost like a you know a phone receiver, but with the touchscreen on the side and it was really weird. There were prototypes like that going around, and I think there was just this one probably Finnish engineer that really just got into his head that the side talking thing will be all the rage. That people want to talk to mobile phones like they used to talk to you know old school phones or whatever. So. I think that's kind of where it happened. And I think mechanically, uh, there was no reason for the, the earpiece to be on the side or any of those things. It was just that someone internally decided this is a novel, cool new thing that people will love. And then they just went with it. What? There is totally an earth too where everyone has side talking touchscreen phones. We just ended up in the wrong timeline. The one with coronavirus. Here's reporter Chris Morris again, who was reporting for CNN Money when the N-Gage launched. We had a review unit that had been sent to us at CNN, and I tried it, 
and just realized what a terrible system it was. And so I had written up this extensive column about all of the the flaws of the Engage and how if you wanted to transfer from one game to the other, uh, it took the better part of two or three minutes, as I recall, because you had to take the back of the case off and take the battery out and then replace the game and then you know do it all in reverse and then reboot the system, which was not a fast boot. So this seemed especially weird to me. And like with side docking itself, I assume there had to be a mechanical or engineering reason for making swapping out the game so difficult. But like with side docking, that turned out not to be the case either. The device itself was designed to be a texting device. So, you know, Optimus for texting, that's why they have the keypads on, on you know, the other two, two different sides and all that kind of stuff. But then I think there was an engineer somewhere in Finland who had ported Doom, the original Doom, to the S60 platform. So they realized that this feature phone designed to optimize texting could run games, real games with 3D engines, as opposed to, say, Snake. And they just said, great, we'll make it a gaming device and compete with Nintendo. But the hardware had already been designed in such a way that you had to remove the battery to swap out the memory card. On a feature phone, that's the card you'd maybe have put some MP3s on. It wasn't something people would have been changing that often on a texting-focused device. But then that memory card slot became the game card slot, without any kind of retooling or redesign. And they shipped it. And then Chris Morris wrote his review about what a pain this phone was to use in real life, from powering it down and removing the battery in order to switch games, to the ridiculousness of side-talking itself. But we needed some artwork for that, and I had used the phone just as a phone without the headset, And so I went down the hall and got one of our graphics people and said, listen, I need you to take a picture of me. We're trying to express the frustration and how silly people would look if they were walking down the street holding this like you would normally hold a phone. And uh, little did I know I had given birth to an Internet meme. A photo of Chris holding the Nokia N-Gage to the side of his head and looking very skeptical about it soon appeared on a website called SideTalking.com. I don't remember where I first heard the term side talking. I always kind of thought that the website was the one that came up with that. And within a few weeks, someone alerted me to the site that had gone up and it had sort of taken off from there. The side talking website initially was a collection of photos from these early reviews of people sort of grimacing or looking mildly uncomfortable because they're having to hold this phone in such an unnatural and unusual way. And the photos were so funny because the discomfort was so visible. <laughs> and so you would go to CNET.com or whatever and read a review of the N-Gage and look at the photo and go, oh, that's hilarious. And so the website was those collected, but very quickly became much more. I forget who did it first, but people started taking photos of themselves. The most famous one being my friend Christian Nutt, which you've seen the picture. It's like the ultimate side talking uh, picture of himself holding up this, this phone to his face, <laughs> the worst expression on his face. Christian worked for Game of Sutra at the time, and his photo ultimately surpassed the original Chris Morris photo to be the iconic side talking photo. If you look up Side Talking's page on knowyourmeme.com, the canonical image is the photo of Christian Nutt. There's a link in the show notes where you can see it on our podcast's website, along with a bunch of other good ones. Because pretty soon, it wasn't just the N-Gage that people were using to side talk. It's pretty rare you can pick up a new tech product and your only reaction to that product is braying laughter. And so that was the N-Gage, right? And so after that, it was just a hop, skip, and a jump to answering this question. Like, what if you could side talk on any product? There was an email address on the site where you could submit photos. So in addition to the photos of the journalists, there was sort of a call to action. Send us photos of you side talking. Remember, there was no social media. I think you had to email it, which, to, I mean, it seems, like, it seems like such a dinosaur thing to do now. You have to email something to someone. There was no upload uh, picture to sidetalking.com. There was no functionality for that. Of course, there is no Twitter. There is barely anything to put these funny pictures on. So somebody has to literally go register a domain and put all this stuff on there. And then says, oh, send other pictures. Yeah, social media was in its infancy at this point. 
MySpace was popular, but Twitter and Facebook didn't exist yet, and memes were mostly being shared on message boards and then on these sort of purpose-built, goofy websites. Side talking existed alongside earlier, more widespread memes, like All Your Base Are Belong to Us, The Hamster Dance, and that weird dancing baby that's been circulating since the late 90s. SideTalking.com was one of the first of these single-focus photo meme websites to really take off. It was like the precursor to similar sort of things like the planking or the ice bucket challenge or memes or, you know, I, you see everybody doing it. You want to put your own spin on it and put it out there. Although I think the difference was that the Internet at that time, everything was sort of siloed off. So it was impossible for it to become something that everybody saw and everybody participated in. And there was also because it was all filtered through one person or one central clearinghouse, like there was no way to really subvert it or take it in a different direction or use it as a, as a way to harass people. Uh, you know, it was kind of like, it was, it was pure and beautiful, I think, in a way that everything on the internet is poisoned now. But side talking, just because of the way that the internet worked at that point, it could become this sort of very funny thing, run its course, and not become essentially, you know, toxic later. Because it was curated, nobody could, like, post, you're all dumbasses for doing this. Why are you doing this? <laughs> Which is nice. Yeah, nobody was abusive except for the guy that ran the site. But anyways, yeah. I know I'm going to sound like an old man. It was a better, more gentler time. It wasn't. I mean, the world was still horrible, but like the internet was maybe a good 25 to 40% better because there was slightly more innocence. At the time on the internet, it wasn't like monetization of websites and blogs. That wasn't really a thing. Like people didn't put very many ads on websites, even when they got super popular. Like it just, it wasn't as much of a thing, probably because there wasn't enough money being poured into, to, poured into it to make it a thing. So we were always just making just ridiculous side projects to basically make ourselves laugh and hopefully other people laugh. It was funny because back then, we, it seems like we all had more spare time. I'm Gideon Mayhew, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Icon Factory here in North Carolina. I think we started around the same time that Panic did, actually. They did. Panic and the Icon Factory go way back. And Icon Factory developer Craig Hockenberry is also featured in episode 2, titled Pantscast. Anyway, a lot of people had these sort of single-joke websites. We had another one of our own called marbleofdoom.com that was just a webpage that had the beach ball spinner on it. And you could go and log on there and you could add time. You could time your Mac and how long you would see the Marble of Doom between apps. And you would enter in, like, I waited 30 seconds, I waited a minute, I waited two minutes, whatever. And the, the website just kept a tally of all the time that people w wasted waiting for the Marble of Doom. Alex Pasco had one called CelebritiesEating.com. That was sort of my variant in this world where uh, I would just take pictures of celebrities, comma, eating, and put them up and caption them in any way that I felt was appropriate for that. And it had its own, its own you know, moments of fun popularity. I got interviewed by like a bunch of radio stations and it was in Spin Magazine for some reason. <laughs> I remember, because this was around the same time as SideTalking.com, and it's just <laughs> all the things we, we had so much extra time for back then. Plenty of time for hundreds and hundreds of people to submit photos to this random website, sidetalking.com, not just with the Engage, but with all kinds of things. So I forget what I did. Did you look this up before I got on the phone or do you, do you remember? Is it still accessible? It is very much still accessible. If you visit sidetalking.com or sidetalkin.com, Chris Kohler is wearing a blue Donkey Kong t-shirt and is holding a huge Xbox console to the side of his head, pretending to talk on it like a cell phone. <laughs> oh, God. So many people send in submissions. I, I remember waiting for mine to go up and like refreshing side talking, you know, to, to see if it was going to be up. Because, of course, it's hilarious, right? Because I thought, oh, I'll do it with an Xbox. This will be the funniest thing. And when it finally went up, it went up in a batch of like 100 photos. And there were multiple people doing Xbox. Like I was not, I was definitely not the only one who had that idea. And I wish I had done it with something cooler, but I mean, it was also just like, let me grab the, the biggest game console in the world. 
I think my favorite was the original Xbox that someone was holding against their face. And just the idea that like, yeah, well, if, if the N-Gage is a phone, why isn't that thing a phone, you know? My name is Mike Merrill, and I am a publicly traded person and former employee of Panic. And I was kind of in awe of the side talk and images, and it was sort of intimidating in a way. Like there was some real amazing creativity. Because you could, there was different ways different people would go with it. You could take any random object and just hold it up to your side of your face, but there was something especially funny about taking items that somehow related to the Nokia N-Gage. Like just the idea of like kind of related to it was especially endearing. So I am side talking on a very early Dance Dance Revolution pad for I believe the PlayStation 2. And it's, and it's funny because it kind of looks like a blanket. <laughs> I, I'm not actually side talking on it. I am talking into the port that would go into the PlayStation 2 while I comforted myself with my my weighted blanket that is a uh, PlayStation 2 Dance Dance Revolution pad. We just went around the office, the, the lot of us, and started trying to find things that would look really goofy for side talking, you know, that you, know, that you could talk sideways into. And <laughs> some things made the, the cut and some things didn't. And the Mac OS X was new at that time, I think, and that's one of the reasons why one of the images is that. Remember when OS X came in a huge box and you had to buy it for like $129? There's a photo of Gideon holding that huge box up to the side of his head on SideTalking.com. Our Flickr page is still up, and our Flickr page contains all of the photos that we submitted to SideTalking.com. The website would also play a MIDI version of the song Jive Talkin'. SideTalking.com was absurd. Tons of people submitted photos of themselves, side talking on all kinds of things, from cereal boxes to toilets to pets. Some photos were a little cringy, but most of them were pretty funny. And the overall aesthetic was early inept attempt at web design, with broken image tags and exposed HTML all over the place, and plenty of animated GIFs. I think the Drudge Report Siren was on there, a lot of animated GIFs, just a lot of like early internet excitement presented on screen. I remember Yossi Solia, head of global marketing for the N-Gage. He said that while no one on his team submitted a photo to the site, they were all very, very aware of it. And they had their own inside jokes about side talking. Once we were staying at a, in a hotel in New York with the team, and the rooms were so tiny that you couldn't fit into the toilet properly. So we coined the term side I'd bet you a thousand dollars. Wait, no, that's too much money. I'd bet you twenty-five dollars that if side talking happened today with the introduction of a new Nokia phone, everybody would think Nokia was behind it. Everybody would think this site is a hundred percent secret promotion for the new Nokia phone. Um, guaranteed, nobody thought that when side talking came out. But even I would think that today. Like I would think, of, uh, oh, of course, hilarious. Yeah, they're. They're writing a site like a moron who loves their bad phone. They got me. I guess I'll buy it now. <laughs> like, but I wouldn't have thought that at the time. So yeah, Nokia was aware of it, but it definitely was not Nokia's website. But who was behind SideTalking.com? Who would get these hundreds of photos that people were emailing in? I would get them because I made the site. You made the site. I made the site. It was my site. I feel kind of bad. <laughs> In case you were here on the 23 minute mark wondering what any of this has to do with panic friends definitely submitted photos and that was like a funny thing about it like some of my friends from the icon factory submitted photos and there's some photos of panic employees on there there's photos of panic employees that didn't even work at panic yet like ned holbrook who submitted a photo and i didn't even know who he was and then later he worked for us for a little while and he was like oh by the way i have my photo on side talking yeah there's a photo of former panic employee ned holbrook of him side talking with a comically oversized ipod it's like six feet tall the word side talking was so stuck in my head again so both impressed and baffled at spinning what in no way can be considered a, a plus as a feature. Except it totally was. I'm still blown away that there was just this Finnish engineer who thought, someday everyone will side talk. All phones will feature side talking. <laughs> anyway. That word side talking just haunted me. And in that time, when you're haunted by something, you see if the domain name's available. <laughs> That's what you do for fun. So I went and did a whoissidetalking.com and 
of course it was available because who cares? And and it was 1874, or however long ago this was. This did play, take place in the 18th century, right? And it was free, and I registered it. And I just like, well, what am I going to do with this domain? I'll put up these funny photos of these journalists and kind of, there was a careful line. I didn't want to like outright mock this thing because I knew that people worked hard on it. But at the same time, it's inherently funny. And so ended up concocting this like absurd voice for the site of like the Nokia N-Gage super fan. Like this internet dwelling man child who just loves his Nokia N-Gage and wants to like share it with the world and legitimately thinks that side talking is great and is moderately illiterate and, but enthusiastic to the absolute extreme. And so that seemed like a pretty good balance. Like it's not registering NokiaSucks.com or SideTalkingSucks.com. It's like, let's try to bring some comedy into this thing that's pretty ridiculous and never rip on side talking only you know rip on people that hate side talking because this guy that makes the site loves side talking there's like looking back at it there's really funny things because like i that voice today almost hits too close to home as like a entitled gamer sort of 4chan voice which now just gives me the total heebie-jeebies and back then like that Oh, that person definitely did exist, but I definitely wasn't aware of them. And now we know way too much about them. And so it's it's funny the things that when you look back and you're like, well, yeah, I wouldn't have done that today. But at the time, it made perfect sense. The side talking guy persona reminds me of like a prototypical the share zone admin person on Twitter. If you don't know what I'm talking about, have a look at at the share zone. The O is a zero on Twitter and enjoy the weird positivity. There's definitely like a spiritual connection between Dash Share Zone and Side Talking Guy, who has no name, whoever Side Talking Guy is, of, yes, like, poor punctuation and capitalization, really, like, making up words just occasionally to suit your purposes, preposterously enthusiastic, but also, like, kind of a dark underbelly. <laughs> At the same time, yeah, I feel like Side Talking Guy and Dash Share Zone admin would get along really well. Let's just write in the language and voice of this like mega Nokia N-Gage super fan that will like probably get a side talking tattoo at some point and is just all in on this phone and maybe saw people making fun of side talking and thought, no, 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 no. You do not make fun of side talking. This is my side talking. We are going to celebrate it. Screw it off, Nokia, or <laughs> whatever I wrote. I don't even, I don't, it was like going into a fugue state writing that site. I think that Cable entered sort of a fugue state and became a different person who was maybe a, a mirror version uh, of himself who was the biggest side talking enthusiast. It, it was as if layers of him were stripped away and just like the, the inner joy of a 12-year-old engaged Nokia fan erupted, but with all the same skills and mental abilities as Cable himself. And I just feel like he just, he just created this beautiful website in awe of the idea of side talking and, and the engage itself, but really about side talking and how this was like a, a new way of interacting with the world. And he did it in a way that was so completely earnest and loving that the humor of it just kind of came through and like no one could clearly love side talking this much. But there was no there was no twisting of the knife or there's no like I mean the joke the joke was created by Nokia itself and so he didn't need to add more to it. Aw, poor Engage. It's not like it was a bad idea. Combining a phone and a handheld gaming device was really obviously a good idea one that eventually came to pass in the iPhone and other modern smartphones. We had a fantastic team, amazing people that are now working at, you know, some of the best gaming companies in the world and beyond. And, you know, it was a great time having Nokia back it up with, you know, tons of money and, you know, us crazy gamers getting to create a dream thing. Obviously not being able to necessarily affect the device itself, but doing a lot of really pioneering 
amazing work. People who work at major game companies now, like Finnish companies Supercell and Rovio, were doing great work on games for the N-Gage, which was not easy to design for, considering that its screen was vertical instead of horizontal. So porting games especially was a pain. Which was another failing of the design of the device itself. But I found one person who had an N-Gage and loved it. Mostly. Kinda. Ulla Carlson, who earlier described the N-Gage as the elephant ear, bought one secondhand when he was a teenager, so at least he didn't pay full price for it. Oh, have I mentioned that on top of its other ridiculous flaws, the N-Gage also had an MSRP of 299 US dollars. Maybe it sounds fine now, but that's like 425 US dollars today, and back then, that was way more than most phones cost, and the Game Boy Advance retailed for 99 dollars. Okay, but so, Ula got around the big price tag, and also found a way to get around having to power down the device and remove the battery to change games. He hacked it. He even put movies and episodes of The Simpsons on it. Remember, this was like 2004, so that's impressive. I love that we could play movies. <laughs> that was amazing. I just like bought the memory card and loaded everything onto it. It was like super easy to hack, I think. And the resolution was horrible, but... Which is funny, the brightness was terrible. It was, it was like basically unusable outside. But I think also back then I texted a lot. So maybe like I remember talking on the phone was quite expensive in Sweden back then. So maybe I texted more. Oh man, that's what the N-Gage was originally optimized for. Yes, Ula was like the ideal N-Gage power user. Uh, except for the hacking, I guess. This is where the story gets even weirder. Well, yeah, you knew that it had to. One day out of the blue, I get an email from somebody actually at Nokia. I'll see if I can find it and look it up for you, Krista. He found it. Check out the link in the show notes. We felt like Kimball was like an influencer, you know, and we were like, hey, so you've created this amazing thing. We want to be a part of it somehow in a positive way. Basically, the gist of it was, we have a new N-Gage coming out, the N-Gage QD, and we're getting rid of side talking. <laughs> Can we work something out or do something with your website to get the message across that side talking is dead? We kind of wanted to use it as a bit of a fun thing to promote the new device. We didn't force anything down his throat. Like you have to do it like this or you have to do that. But it was more like, here's some devices. Hope you like it. You know, see if you can promote it and so forth. You know, I'm no fool. Well. That's not entirely true. But usually, I'm not a fool. No, sometimes I'm not a fool. And in this case, I was like, this is, there's no other exit strategy for SideTalking.com. This site has no end, and I will spend the rest of my life posting these photos, which wasn't necessarily true. But I was like, yes, absolutely, let's do it. I can make this really ridiculous page where the Side Talking guy is just absolutely furious that you are removing the best feature of the N-Gage from the N-Gage and I can update the site and that will be like kind of a subversive way to advertise that the, you know, N-Gage QD is a new and better product. And so Cable wrote an ending to SideTalking.com. The best part of any Side Talking update was to go to real old animated GIF collections on the web and try to find the best animated GIFs. That was easily the best part, and I found just the perfect one, which is this weird purple blob creature sort of sobbing. And I'm like, why am I laughing? Because now that I think about it, it's so sad. He's just like, has this mournful face and looks up at the sky with tears streaming down his face and like just looping over and over again. And I don't know why it's a purple blob. But this is a, it's such a good gift. Oh, the second I saw that, I was like, yeah, that's going right on there. And it's also like, there's other classic side talking guy crutches, like forgetting to close your image tags and like putting the wrong width and height, you know, exposing raw HTML. There's a running gag of just constantly getting the copyright dates wrong on everything, like saying copyright 1991 to 2007, like just not having any concept of how copyright dates work, which is why I was so happy when I tweeted 
Does anyone have any memories or, you know, or have any photos on side talking? Let me know. And on my tweet, I said, copyright 1997 or whatever. I put that at the bottom and a guy replied. He's like, I think you have those dates wrong. Those are not the correct copyright dates for this. And I was like, yes, gotcha. <laughs> side talking guy, 2020, it still works. Yeah, it felt so good. Sorry, guy. But uh, yeah, it, finding the right animated GIFs writing the right amount of garbage and just above all else being incredibly angry at Nokia for, for removing what is indisputably the best feature of Engage. And so it was really fun to write that page. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It was extremely fun to write that page. Well, anyway, so uh, I cut a deal with them. They paid me $5,000. And so he, he he tells me this and I'm like, they're gonna give you five grand just to like to to stop making fun of them. <laughs> I just I was I was totally confused by like even what they were doing and why they thought this would be a good idea, but I I was like, well, if I may, Alex had a very specific idea of what I should do with that money. Let's take that money, and take it to Las Vegas, and film ourselves wasting it in every conceivable way we can think of, like, you know, tearing up $100 bills into, like, the fanciest toilet we could find or whatever, and let's record that and put it on the website right next to their ad. They actually made a commercial, like, an actual commercial where they, like, hired actors and, like, art directed it and did the full thing. It probably cost a million dollars, and the whole point of the commercial was no more side talking. And it was like a kid drew like daddy on a piece of paper, but drew daddy with an enormous ear. So you can see the ad and Alex and Cable's absolutely preposterous Las Vegas video. Nah, they didn't actually end up going to Vegas. I bought a Philips plasma television. They were very expensive back then. <laughs> That's a lot of money for a TV. And I thought this was like the greatest idea in the history of time, uh, but he bought a TV, so I'm glad for him for that. <laughs> in addition to the $5,000, Nokia gave Cable three Nokia N-Gage QD devices, one of which he gave to his friend Jonna Bechtel, another one ended up somewhere in storage at the Panic office, and no one remembers what happened to the third one. In exchange, Nokia got the weird fake rage and sorrow of the N-Gage guy, plus five side-talking-related domain names, including both sidetalking.com and sidetalkin.com. I know the official Nokia term was sidetalking, but I knew that no one was going to call it that, so that's why I registered both those domains at the same time. Oh, but turns out he never actually transferred those domain names over to Nokia. Oops. And there's one more weird twist. Mike Merrill remembers maybe buying sidetalking.com from cable at some point, but no one can seem to pin down the details. The only mention of it I can find is an archive of my old blog, but where I was doing like a quarterly update of all my many different projects. And I think I was excited because I realized that with that, with Nokia's new excitement about it and, and you know, buying cable out, I was like, oh wait, technically, that's mine because I bought this from cable. At the time, I was doing a lot of very sort of weird and interesting things around the idea of, hey, can we all get together and collectively purchase something? And the first side talking wave, which was the pure enthusiasm, still had enough traffic. And my idea was like, just put ads on it or play around with it that way. And you don't have to do anything. It just had traffic. So I was, that was my original plan, but I didn't want to buy it myself because I wasn't sure that there was enough traffic to actually like make it work. So I distributed that risk among some people. What is he talking about? I don't remember any of this. You just, whatever Mike says, it probably happened and I don't remember it. So just talk to Mike. He'll cook something up as he does. <laughs> whatever it is and just okay whatever he says I'm sure it happened I don't remember I feel like probably what happened was because I can't find it I don't even have email records back that far it seems like something I would have emailed but uh it may have been like a verbal agreement with cable and, and more of a conversational thing but it was definitely something that I that I had other people you know quote unquote invest in I have a weird memory of this but it's not clear, right? Because because Mike did this a lot, so I remember him talking about this at one point, and like I think talking to his shareholders about it. But 
that's as far as I remember this particular story. Like, and I've been bugging people, and no, everyone's email seems to stop at the archive of like 2005. No one has anything before that. So it's very strange. Lost to the mysteries of time. If you're wondering what kind of shareholders we're talking about here, visit kmikeem.com. When Mike said he's a publicly traded person, he meant that you can buy shares in his life choices. The more kmikeem stock you own, the more you directly influence his decisions. But okay, that's basically it for the weird twists, I think. What happened next was, effectively, SideTalking.com and SideTalkIn.com were frozen in time for over a decade. Cable continues to renew the domain registration every year, and in 2018 added a link from the sad end of Side Talking front page to what SideTalking.com looked like before the Nokia deal, so you can experience both the original site and its farewell page in all their weird glory. The Engage as a device and also a gaming platform as it was briefly ultimately failed. But Nokia itself is still a thriving company with over 100,000 employees worldwide, though it sold off its phone business to Microsoft in 2014. That has a lot more to do with the iPhone and the rise of smartphones generally than it does with the Engage, of course. But anyway, Nokia is fine. It still does a bunch of licensing for other phone companies and makes telecommunication infrastructure equipment. Not bad for a company that started as a pulp mill in 1865. So... Looking back now, knowing what we know about making hardware, it's so hard because it's one of those things where I'm sure everything made sense at the time. There's no question in my mind that those two design decisions were completely 100% logical to the people that decided them and agreed to them. That, of course, the only place we can put this is under the battery because... That way the game slot is soldered to the motherboard and we don't have to get a, a ribbon cable to move it to the lower edge, which would also increase RF interference, which would cause us to fail our FCC testing. You know, there's a reason why the game slot was under the battery. Similarly, there's no question in my mind there's a reason why you had to side talk. I just don't know what that reason is. I, wish, I want to find out so bad. Yeah, no, sorry. Pretty much what happened was one Finnish engineer thought that side-talking would be a cool new thing, and the phone was designed to be a texting device that wouldn't need to have its memory card switched out very often, and they just didn't redesign it after realizing it could play games. Oops. Thanks so much for joining me for this episode of The Panic Podcast. This is the second-to-last episode of Season 1. Panic is still chugging along with everyone working from home, and thankfully, everyone is safe and healthy. We hope you're doing okay, too. The final episode of Season 1 will be about Playdate, so mash that subscribe button as hard as you can and tell your friends to give it a listen. This podcast was written, produced, and edited by me, Krista Mergen, and our amazing theme music was, of course, composed by Cable Sasser. Nevin Mergen designed the podcast page and artwork. Tim Coulter built the website and wrangles the podcast feed. Michael Buckley made the super cool Audion web player, featuring tons of faces he revived from the Audion archive. You can see and use it by hitting the play button on any podcast on our podcast's page. A huge thank you also to Chris Kohler, Alex Pasco, Ulla Carlson, Chris Morris, Yossi Solia, Gideon Mayhew, and Mike Merrill. And thanks, of course, to everyone at Panic. I cut this little snippet of Stephen Frank talking about why he doesn't listen to podcasts out of our episode about Pantscast because it just seemed a little too mean. It's pretty funny, though. You know, there's always some nerds podcast that has some intro with like 10 seconds of intense heavy metal, you know, electric guitar rage and and this nerd comes on like, oh, hey, welcome to my podcast. Uh, This is Star Trek News. And uh, I don't know, that always makes me chuckle. And again, I'm very sorry to all the podcasters out there.
Trek news. And there's your new song to wash your hands to. Extra special thanks to John Black of Fort Atlantic. Stay well, everybody.